Take these old ones home unless you. No, thank you. How did he get that? He was right in the fire snapping pictures. It's horrible. Look at that. Looks like Iwo Jima, doesn't it? With the flag? Mm -hmm. Only they're being crushed. <laughs> Carried by escalators into the flames. Did you see it on TV after the. When it, it was horrible, wasn't it? More than 80? They were laid out like shish kebab in the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> and it was raining. And the steam was rising off the corpses in the rain. I don't remember that. Don't you? Are you, are you sure? Because are you think those pictures were taken that day because it seems sunny. It seems sunny. It does. I probably misremembered. Every time you turn on the TV, don't you agree, Miss Cassandra? All the corpses just blur together. I'm sorry. Uh, it was just, I'm sorry, it was my name. I didn't think you, well, well, perhaps I should ask, do, do I smell funny? For instance, is my perfume all right? Oh, you are nervous. They flew me from Dallas. Oh, it's 101 in Dallas already this morning. Shh. That's, uh, I, I can believe it. It's very hot there all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Was it a special news item, or do you, well, you know, maybe have some relatives? Are you sure if you don't whiff, sort of? Yeah. It, it was a special news item. Hottest place in the USA. Hotter than Phoenix. Hotter than Yuma. They'll catch up by noon. They're in the desert. The temperature drops off and the sun goes down, but didn't cool off at all in Dallas last night. It's up around 90 here in Houston. When do you think the... smell liquor. Is that you? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably just mouthwash. Are you about to speak? 
Yes. And I thought better of it. <laughs> statement in your own words. I'm sorry, no. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd be happy to address any questions I can answer briefly, but uh, I'm completely new to this procedure. I have no idea what the procedure is, or even if this is actually a procedure, something with a, a preset. I'll tell you this much. I found myself on the merry-go-round where the gold ring grabs you. You just, we just, well, you just sit there waiting for the shadow to fall on you, and, well, you know, when I was a girl, we had, well, back in Ukiah in California, I kept chickens. And every once in a while, a hawk will get one. They'll come ram it over the clouds and knock a chicken's head off and dig out a couple of handfuls of breast and adios. And I don't see how a rambling monologue beyond this admittedly extensive depiction of the situation. District 9 is the chicken coop of doom. Well, now, you've been with agriculture for five years. And about seven months. Five years and seven months. And you are currently level four. Have I got that right? That's right, right. Administrative and field coordinator, second class. And at the time of the Kernwood Farms investigation, that is the second investigation, the one in which you took part. I was acting AFC first class. That was temporary. It was understood at the outset to be temporary. All right, a general question. Happy with the work? No. Uh, for the last two years, I've just been waiting for this part to be over with. All right. More generally than that, just overall. <laughs> yes. Yes, very definitely. I, I travel. Uh, I meet new people. I'm always forced to confront new tasks. I'm always learning. And, uh, but I suppose that's because we make everything we do, you know, a little harder than it has to be. So sometimes you're disillusioned with the work. No, no, it's just that in a bureaucracy. Oh, you're not disillusioned by the work, just by its nature. No, of course not. But it, what do we do? I mean, we inspect food. I mean, haven't human beings sort of, you know, been inspecting whatever goes in their mouths since? Well, we couldn't have invented the wheel if we couldn't keep from killing ourselves with the stuff we ate. In a way, we're less developed than cave dwellers. Ms. Cassandra, you're being very open with me, and I'd like to be the same. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it, it's this. Uh, my feelings are hurt. Why? Why are my feelings hurt? Yes. Because I'm realizing you have no appreciation for the purity of what I do. I do not inspect food. I have no interest in what you do, or what the department does, none whatsoever, or in anything that goes on outside this room. <laughs> or ever has, or ever will go on. All I am, I dedicate to the purity of what we are doing now. And what is that? Well, I'm interrogating you. Everything I have done since we found ourselves here a few minutes ago has been intended to further the process. The light's neither intense nor dim. It's neutral, you see. Chair's comfortable. It doesn't invite you to doze off. Nothing around here is intended to intimidate. When I showed you the pictures in the news magazine, I meant to posit a world which we have left behind and to which we don't really wish to return, do we? Well, now, now we have this process all around us. World of charred bodies? A history that is really entirely out of our control, whereas here in the department, things are actually within our grasp. If we adopt procedures, carry them out, that sort of thing. Sounds boring, doesn't it? It's really a universe within our control. Elaborate collaboration. Government doesn't really govern anything, does it? But it can attempt to govern itself, and it may from time to time succeed. But 
the attempt. We do not profit by an attitude of trying. job of remaining quiet. <laughs> Thank you. You're not volunteering any information. Thank you. Marigold, I want to suggest an attitude for us both to take. Of course. May I read you a paragraph from the journal? Do you know who John Wesley Powell was? Uh, oh, sorry. No. Oh, Mr. Uh, Powell was an explorer. He and his party were the first white people to navigate the Colorado River back in the early 19th century. May I read you this paragraph from his journal? The canyon is much narrower than any we have seen. With difficulty we manage our boats. They spin about from side to side and we know not where they are going. Find it impossible to keep them headed down the stream. At first this causes us great alarm, but we soon find there is but little danger, and it is a general movement of progression down the river, to which this whirling is but an adjunct, and it is the merry mood of the river to dance through this deep, dark gorge. <laughs> well, well, so I guess you want me to cooperate like a lost soul in the Rager River or something? That sort of reminds me of... Or, or more surrender or... You know, speaking of the Colorado... What was the basic function or the goal as you understood it? Team one. Did something remind you of something did you say? It, it, it was, no, no, it was nothing, sorry. No, all right, I'll repeat. What was the basic function or the goal, as you understood it, of Team One? I was happy when I got Team One. That does not answer my inquiry. I was happy for reasons that turned out to be bad things. Team One sounded primary, top team. It was really only equal to anything else, but it felt more in the spotlight. More, we're number one, and now it, it gets more of the heat. Team One gets no heat whatsoever, Marigold. That chapter is closed. We're here for back and forth exchange, and I'm merely picking Team One as a starting point for that exchange. What was the mission of Team One? Can I ask you something? If you, why do you want to know about Team One if you don't care about what we do, as you say? Mayor Gold. I'm asking the question. We were in charge of the jam. And ultimately the jam got not only the cameras, but the spotlight, didn't it? And the notoriety. Yes, ma'am, it did. Uh, the jam was not the place to you were satisfied initially with the plan as outlined. Yes. We were all very excited, all the teams, but especially those of us on Team One, because we had the jam, and, and that made us one of the two link teams with the food and drug people. <laughs> Nobody actually realized we didn't have a plan. We had the teams, we had procedures, we had goals, but that didn't add up to an actual step-by-step. -step. And since Turner Farms grows all the food it cans, except for the fruit. We were scrutinizing the part of the situation that dealt with orchards and, and <laughs> transported fresh produce, the jam. And I had the top spot on the jam. Your team were you, Jones, Michaels, Delacorte, and, and Jones. Jones. Jones, Jones, Michaels, Jones one, yes. And Alan Tui. Here we go. Well, didn't you find yourself sometimes alone with any of your team? Well, you were under pressure. The investigation became nightmare. Yes, and I wish you'd get to the question I know you're going to ask. 
so I can deny it ever happened. Did you invite Alan Tui to apply jam to your private places and look it away? Never. <laughs> Not even once. Alan Tui is psychotic. Well then. You're all loony. That question is behind Are you that. writing this down? Uh, it's being recorded. <laughs> Because tone of voice is often so important. Without it, a, a remark can sound absurd or damning when it's really neither one. Do you see? Yes, I've seen everything can either be absurd or damning. Yes, ma'am. So my outburst is gonna be perfectly preserved in a little bureaucratic jar of jam. Mirabel, I welcome your outburst. I think of them as explosions of truth. <laughs> yeah. Facts are truth. Only when a fact has been interpreted by a desiring mind and colored by emotion does it become truth. You've been at this work a long, long time. <laughs> do you understand what I mean when I tell you I'm not interested in what you do? What I'm saying is actually a lot more radical than you might think. I'm telling you I am completely uninterested in the fact. This inquiry is your chance to be understood. I appreciate that. Uh, no, you don't really. You're just being polite. Okay? So then, shut it. <laughs> when I asked you the question you wanted me to ask concerning you and Mr. Alan Tuey, I was asking you to say yes or no to a, a statement that claimed to be factual. I understand that, and it never happened. Well, I would hope that even if it had happened, you would deny it. I would hope that in order to be truthful, you would deny the facts. Those are not the facts. I have here a statement submitted by Mr. Allen Tui. You seen it? I've seen it. I have a copy in my purse. Well, Mr. Tui submitted this, and he has signed it. And you'll see there is a place for your signature also. I'll sign it. Do you think I care anymore? About this? I hope you don't. I certainly don't. I don't! I have nothing but contempt for everything that's going on here. Well, I have more contempt for these statements than I would have for excrement. <laughs> <laughs> I need some kind of representative. I should have asked for a representative. You're putting me on. Of course not. Deceiving me. I'm just asking for a representative. Mary Gold, I think you woke up this morning, knocked back a double at Charlie's timeout lounge, and floated in here without a clear idea about anything. I am formally asking for a representative. I am your representative. Miracle. I am the ombudsperson for human resources for the southwestern region. I take your case to them. And if necessary, in order to demonstrate my contempt for these statements, I will douse myself with gasoline and light myself a fire. <laughs> <laughs> I support you in signing this as a gesture underlining its complete absurdity. Since the jam fiasco, you've been placed under Catherine Wendell who was transferred temporarily from District 5. Do you understand the purpose of Kate Wendell's temporary assignment? Kate Wendell is among us to collect scalp. Precisely, that is what she does. And right now, she is in the process of selling yours from your skull. She's brought a series of flagrantly silly actions against you. And this is just the latest, putting you up for suspension while human resources rejuvenates this ancient allegation. I say something that might be misinterpreted outside this room. You are lovely. And alone. So very much. 
much like that night. That young girl, that black factory girl. Wasn't she lovely? Yes. So lovely and so alone. And when she sang the national anthem. I know, of course I know, believe me. This is a moment when you know history is being made. I mean that every moment is history. When I, when I, when I talked about the, the steam rising off the corpses in the rain, I'm not sure I, I understand. Um, um, but, but of course I remember Tanya Cruz in her lab coat thing, singing the Star Spangled Banner. Oh, believe me, in her hairnet. I knew my little life wouldn't be the same. A black child. After that, Seems oh, say you a see. dozen United States senators in a jam factory in the Department of Agriculture tramples to its roots. Of dog, and she could sing. Is that history. history? Whether it happened or not. Happened. But it had the tenor of emotion. It didn't lie there like a fact. It vibrated with life. service trucks and, and this throbbing generators and the, the exhaust off the generators and this sweet smell like, like some kind of blossom. Throbbing generators. Sitting in the car, sweating. <laughs> Cracked the window for air, the skeeters swarmed in, you keep the skeeters out, it was like a steam cooker in there. And the Senate hearings were 2,000 miles away, Texas all around us, Louisiana over that way about 60 miles. And in that direction, you could feel the continent turning to mush, to swamp. You could feel ghosts with malaria wandering around, old spells, brown bones. It was like we were on this little saucer of earth that had been cut away underneath us, and here we are floating all this red darkness that was completely real. But the issue, the goals, the procedures, that was, <laughs> that was a comic book. The, the Department of Agriculture, it was a dream. Somebody made it up and, and I'm sitting here with this jar of Kramer Farms jams in my hand. <laughs> and it could have been full of secret voodoo fetuses. I mean, it was scary and ridiculous, a jar of Louisiana madness, and, and we'd opened it up, and it was all over us. You couldn't make sense of that unreality. You couldn't pay homage to that absurdity and that fear simply by saying everything seems so crazy. Holding this ridiculous jar of jam. There were 17 girls trapped in there for the third day. A simple inspection turned into a movie. Into the Alamo. Yeah. 
held up that jar of jam and you said, Thanks. I said, Hey, Alan, do you want to throw this on my tits and lick it off? <laughs> mm. It was a poem. It was. What's the meaning of this? writes a letter, do we have to jump in the planes and blow miles in the air to join the rooms and say things we could say on the phone? Yeah, no. After lunch, and, and we'll decide. All right? Please. Respectfully. Please, yeah, I have it right here beside me. Okay, bye, George. first thing. I have three brothers, and if it is my brother, and it isn't Mark or Luke or John, then I don't know what who it is. And you're aware of what he's done. Is it Mark? <laughs> and you're aware of what he's done, but you won't say clearly that it's your brother who has undertaken this mischief, because that's all it is. Okay. Okay, good. Because if you told me that Cass was up a tall building with an arsenal, I'd believe it. Cass, yeah, you call him Cass, my brother Mark. He doesn't have an arsenal. Does he have a gun? Well, you tell me. What kind of firepower do you think we're talking about here? I should, I should, where is this happening? I, I mean, I don't even know what city he lives in. Maybe I should, I should be there. Beautiful. Right now? You're bringing an incredible energy into this room. You've torn the roof off, and money is pouring in. I'm a little reluctant to bring you back to Earth. I want to get back to Earth. Well, sometimes the things I allow to invigorate me aren't clean. I think I'm destroying myself. God damn you! Mark Cassandra, 
and sent a letter to the National Director of Human Resources. That's all? I want to ask you a question. Huh? When you first came in here, you seemed like something like, like a receptionist or a cleaning lady. But then it turns out you're not. You're the troubleshooter for regional human resources. Huh? But isn't it possible you're really not the troubleshooter for regional human resources? But really, actually, in fact, the fucking cleaning lady. Because you are insane. And it's easier to figure, hey, insane cleaning lady, than to think, wow, the human resources ombudsperson for the Southwest region is a sadistic homosexual maniac. Homosexual maniac. Homosexual! 
sexual maniac. Homosexual maniac. Homosexual maniac. Homosexual maniac. Homosexual maniac. down the Colorado River one time. I saw him one spring. He stopped at my place in Dallas. Said he was headed to Arizona. Gonna run one of those rafts for those outfits that takes a raft down the river and through the canyon. I said, Cass, how did they pick you? He said, well, I met the owner of the company in this bar, and I said, hey, I wouldn't mind a job like that. And he said, well, do you have any rafting experience? And he said, hell yes. All over the rivers of South Texas, every damn river. <laughs> That's Cass. I don't think he'd ever been in a rowboat at this point. I don't think he'd splashed around in anything bigger than a stock pond. <laughs> After he got out there, I tried to call him once. But the office in Grand Canyon country said, oh yeah, he works for us, but he is out on a trip right now on the Colorado River. Now, what was that man's name? The Explorer. Uh, pal, pal, John. Uh, John, pal. John, Well, Cass came back through Dallas in the fall, said that he had driven a raft with eight people, three workers, and all their gear in it, all their food, their camping equipment, all that. And he said, the second day out on the river, he heard this funny sound. He said, hey, Cookie, is there a train down this deep in the river? And the cook said, what are you talking about? He said, I mean, it sort of rumbles and rumbles. Are you sure there's not a train down this deep in the canyon? And the cook says, what are you talking about? How many times have you run this river? You really don't know what that sound is? And Cass says, hell, I've never drove one of these things in my whole life. I'm just picking it up as I go along. And he says, get this raft over to the side. And they stay the night. And he tells him everything he knows about running the raft in a giant river with about a dozen people on board. And so the next day, they put her in. And that rumble gets louder and louder. And inside of 15 minutes, it's just this nonstop thunder filling the whole Grand Canyon. And he comes around a curve. And the whole river is this white giant monster avalanche of snow down over a field of boulders. And he says, I steered her into that thing. And inside of five minutes, I wrecked her so bad. I don't think they'll ever find the little rubber bits of it if there's any left. But the people loved it. Didn't nobody get hurt too bad. They radioed in for a for a chopper to come in when the next raft came along, and they all got choppered out. It was the best damn raft trip those people ever had. They didn't let him near the tiller again, you can bet, but he spent the rest of the summer working as a helper. Now, isn't there a Lake Powell down in Colorado or something like that? Yes. Colorado.
just like Bill Jenks. Well, why Bill? The world's only snake with legs. <laughs> Siberian shaman. Bill! <laughs> oh, do you recognize me at all? Mm, I don't think so. Uh, can I have a coffee? I want to get really nervous. I brought up six courtesy packs upstairs. That's all they had. I need to be creative. Um, I'm sorry, I just plumped down. Is it okay? Uh, I never really knew you over in, uh, just by reputation. Uh, the, I never really knew you had a sense of humor. You know, the world's only snake with legs. It's well meant. Respectfully. Fear them. Oh, call a spade a spade. Uh, but the Siberian shaman, is that new? Well, sure, I'm new. Really? Uh, yeah, it's, you do seem different. There's an air almost about you. The man who survived Siberia, me and District 9. Tell me about it. I don't think I have to. I just didn't think things like that ever got back to people. Oh, you're behind the back things. Well, like, how did, how did old uh, Wild Bill get wind of? Yeah, he got snitched. Oh, he didn't. What? Oh, he hasn't heard it. Well, but I have, because, uh, well, I'm not him. <laughs> Bill Jenks. You're not Bill Jenks. Oh, but wait a minute, wait a minute. I do to know Bill Jenks. I spent 45 minutes with him yesterday in his office. Late with Snake and Steph. And I do agree I look like him. Well. Huh. <laughs> I'm down from Washington. Sure, are you, uh, district regional? Well, I'm Washington, so I'm national. Well, you're not like an undersecretary or something? No, I just report to a few, like Chalmers and Don Stasio and Tina Ray. Coffee? So I'm kind of there to say I know about your... So I, yeah, I'm sorry. So I know about your, uh, know about your situation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> your turn not to be embarrassed? Well, if you know, you know. Well, that's the spirit. Really? What is the spirit? I mean, that's, uh, I don't know. Do you know about Madame Butterfly? The opera? I'm not sure if it's an opera exactly. Well, isn't it about a man who has an affair with another man, dresses a woman for like 25 years or something? Wow. No, I mean, uh, sure, it might, possibly. For all I know, I don't know. <laughs> sure. Well, um, the Siberian Shaman, oh, that's a new one. Why do they call oh, him? Oh, Jinx. Uh, oh, Jinx got religion. I think he was something. Oh, you mean like? Uh, something religious, like he took it seriously. Oh, yeah, after the transfer, he took it to another level. More to a point well beyond seriously. The last couple of years, he's been, uh, he's been a shepherd to his own little flock. Really, you mean like a pastor? Yeah, I'll show him. He's a pop of tax exempt status. <laughs> Everybody, you look at him, has some kind of terrible secret, don't they? Oh, he come to work this morning in a white minivan with lettering on the side that says, Worldwide Fellowship, Children of Jehovah. Yeah, you seem nervous? <laughs> I'd say I'm more of a combination of stimulated and anxious. Well, that would add up to you. Nervous, nervous, nervous uh, but it's more as if I'm proud for this thing. I'm pumped, I'm ready, but uh, <laughs> at the same time, I'm worried. More and more every minute. It's one session and you're done. What you got to be worried about, Riggs? Riggs who? Oh, well, Riggs. Riggs the wimp. You don't got to be worried about Riggs. Just that's what you're up against. There's, there's Riggs and there's no throat and toast. Uh, toast? Oh, Jack Toast. An unusual name, but not unheard of. Who's Jack Toast? <laughs> oh, toast. Well, that's um. uh... I'm me. That's, uh... Toast? I thought you knew the lineup. Um, are you sure you have the right, uh... Oh, I'm not sure. I just guessed. Are you Catherine Wendell? Okay. John Toast. Well, well if I've met about one-third of the lineup, I guess I should feel about 33% less anxious. Oh, I'm not aware. I'd be a tiger in any investigation, but this is not my uh, investigation. investigation. Or interview. Well, which is it? I was told. Oh, interview. It's an interview. Well, why did you say? Well, generally, I do conduct investigations, but in this case, that is not the case. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I'm, could, I'm monitoring an interview. Okay, well, John. Jack. Jack, John, what's the difference? I prefer Jack. Mr. Toast, 
What is the difference between an interview and an investigation? Well, an investigation might consist of a, of a series of interviews. <laughs> <laughs> but an interview would be unique, unrepeatable. See, an investigation would seek facts to be uh, submitted in a report, while an interview would seek an interchange to be reported in a memo. <laughs> or an investigation is terrifying, or an interview. Is it? Then why am I terrified? Well, you got the jitters. You know, six parts of coffee. Why are you monitoring? Well, that's what I do. I thought you conducted. Well, I do. I am an investigator, but in this case, the marketing process is part of a larger inquiry. Inquiry? Uh, that's terrifying? Yes. It's the most terrifying thing in our business. Well, but not for you. No? No, because the inquiry isn't about you. It only has to do with your district. Look, whenever your district has initiated a process of termination, inevitably that process is going to end up in a... You know, the term wait, what? <laughs> Terminated? Am I being terminated? Oh, no, come on, wait a minute. Let, let's back up. Because I thought I was just going to go in there. It takes about uh, 33 minutes. I've uh, described the circumstances, her actions, Miss Marigold Cassandra. Hey. I brought my notes. I didn't bring any notes I about me. I really it. just came to see the opera. Let's back and it up. And Butterfly. And now I'm being. Uh, hey. And you see me, I look like, uh, what's his, uh... Um, the Siberian Shaman. Yeah, Jinx, Bill. You sit down and say, hi, <laughs> hi. And here we are now on the Espresso Express in a room full of Germans. Germans? Yeah, I think so. Well, well it's decorated. Yeah, I thought it was a gimmick. I mean, listen, I, mean, you know, I thought it was a gag, but... I don't have a speaking German. Do you think they can understand us? Oh, I think so. Nobody speaks on German. <laughs> this is a hotel for Germans. Oh, Latin like heaven in, uh, in Germany. A lot of places. That's really. Uh... <laughs> well, like everywhere you go, they have uh, hotels for Americans, like in uh, Germany, for instance. Is this going on all over America? Oh, probably. I like can Los Angeles. They have the Meridian or the Orange County. Another hotel for Germans. Oh, the French, you know, Meridian. What? <laughs> I have to stay in a Japanese hotel. Uh... Yeah. But in America, of course. Why not? Oh, oh, in Japan, I guess Japan would make more sense. Why? Well, check, because I don't know. <laughs> sure, okay. <laughs> um, because it's a wish. Uh, if you're going to wish for a Japanese hotel, you might as well wish for a Japanese hotel in Japan, don't you think? Well, it don't seem like much of a wish. Japan would be full of Japanese hotels. You'd expect it. You wouldn't have to wish for it. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, so your first name would be John? Yeah, unless it was my middle name. Well, which is it? Um, Terrence, my first name. <laughs> Terrence John Toast. That is my entire name. <laughs> Don. <laughs> what? Um, my pen stopped on writing notes sideways. Notes? Uh, yeah, just something, uh, just jagging on the job, you know, something to do with my hands. Uh, don't think anyone should know about, uh, I guess, this encounter, a coincidental encounter. Okay, well, so am I supposed to just go into the conference, the interview, in 57 minutes and go and say hi and pretend? Uh, can I expect you to actually be in the room? Why don't we call it a conference? Well, are you there monitoring or are you hiding someplace monitoring? Oh, no, I'm the first one in the room. I go in 50 minutes early. I'm there when you all come in. You three come in together. God, you do look just like Bill Jenks. Well, Bill Jenks brings you in. And we're introduced, you and I, and them, even though we're acquainted. You and I. And them. Briggs and Northrop, but I know them. Uh, but you pretend not to? No, I know them. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't know me? I flew with them down from Washington. First class. Don't dream on. Just wanted to know who I was up against. Nobody, not against. Just that, look, you want to see the first class type? Look, brief second before you all incinerated. I'm just... So you're not the incinerator. You're not the terminator. You're not the investigator. Toast. I'm the monitor. I don't say a word. You're just making no 
that. Uh, can we just back it up all the way back? <laughs> back it up, Jack. I come in here. You come in. I'm that's in here. Monitoring. Minding my own goddamn business, and by a complete coincidence, can we agree on that? A complete coincidence by a random happenstance. Two souls collided in Bavaria. You know, I sort of feel like that sometimes. Well, not well, not about meeting you, but well, yeah, it's about about meeting you, about your district. A lot of folks are of the opinion that District Nine has become a sort of a kind of swamp. Or Bavaria, if you prefer, you know, full of incompetence. Full of snakes without legs. Oh, well, exactly. Where every personnel procedure gets polluted. Y'all too incompetent to weed out the incompetence. And never to be on appeal, the whole process gets reversed. They're reinstated with back pay, and they come back to work with one motivated, pissed off, and still incapable. Oh, yeah. The leg of snake, in case of point. Is it with legs or without? Well, whatever you do to the guy's legs, Jinx is the last idiot who ever transfer out of the ninth. No more refugees. The bridges are blown. Bavaria is festering in its own pus. I saw Riggs and so Northrop before conducting a simple closure interview. Closure? C closure. Yeah, you know, closure. A process to put an end to the entire incident will just seal off this particular compartment. Okay, closure. So Riggs. So Riggs and so Northrop, they get, they get uh, flown out and uh, briefed on compartmentalization. Uh, they get quizzed on. Compartmentalization. Compartmentalization. Oh, it's new. Yeah, it's new because your district. From now on, every investigation will be approached if the matter under scrutiny could be divided into a number of separate but equal compartments. I thought you said it was an investigation. Well, in your case, we only conducted an interview, but, but <laughs> well, look, it really is kind of an elegant process. Would you like to hear about it? Sure. <laughs> The process gets polluted, we arrest the procedure by viewing the entire procedure as a number of discrete entities or units, compartments. When the personal action gets rendered down by idiots or for some reason pollution threatens to render, for instance, a personal action reversible, we seal that compartment off by conducting a closure interview, in this case. In this case? Oh, in other cases, for instance, we go for bifurcation. We split the process into two separate processes. You know, in this instance, the uh, action to shit can Miss Marigold Cassandra. It's this compartment <laughs> issue between you and Marigold Cassandra. That's where the pollution is. Okay, so Jack just how serious is this? Oh, you know better than ask that. I keep reassuring me. <laughs> you know better than ask that while you're taking notes. There. I'm not. Okay? Catherine, can I ask you to destroy those notes? Yes. I'm not sure what was just agreed to. <laughs> <laughs> you asked me you could ask, and I said yes. Yes, I can ask. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what. Why don't you just destroy them? Because I'm not going to ask you what's going on here. And then you ask me to trash the notes. And I think we'll have a deal. Well, it's no deal at all. What am I telling you exactly what's going to find out? Ten minutes in the interview. Uh, it's a what you already know right now. All right, fine. Now, can we, uh, can we back it up a bit? All the way to Genesis. Three years ago, <laughs> District 9 Ennis. Wait, stop. Stop five years ago. Five years ago, District 9 completes a lengthy investigation of Kernwood Farms, which fails to yield satisfactory results. They were everyone bitter that oh, regulations have been flouted with impunity. And yes, I'm quoting from the report, which was basically an oath of revenge. An oath to never give up on the Kernwood Farms, which you understood to be a blood oath to destroy, to crush, to strangle the Kernwood Farm Corporation and bury it, piss on its grave. <laughs> First, an internal bloodbath commenced. Not nothing in the end. A few transfers. Janks. Janks, you bet. 
So that was Code Red Investigation number one. All right, now, three years ago. June, 36 months ago, District 9 on takes the second investigation of the Cuttingwood Farms Corporation. Pretty soon it's clear to everyone from here all the way up to Washington that what District 9 is, what District 9 has created is its own kind of ridiculous Vietnam. <laughs> By forming independent units Teams and attempting coordination with the Food and Drug Administration. Such a massive fiasco of duplication and repetition just playing running around and soon that now it's June. 23 months ago, investigation in place for over a year. Oh, such a fiasco that a three-page overview submitted by a Kernwood attorney's law clerk to a staff on the hill results in hearings televised. Hey, on cable. C-SPAN. Oh, big deal. Big deal, yeah. yeah. Oh, but the senators listened rapidly to descriptions of how Team One would arrive with manifests, waving them in the air for samples just loaded into vans by members of Team Three, while the FDA got two, three, four separate search warrants for the same items convinced they were hidden. Tell me about it. Oh, tell me about it. And it was preempted all of a sudden by a, a miracle televised spectrum. I'm not talking about C spec. My boss argued for the ag side. Even apology. The televised spectacle of 17 workers, the whole 311 shift, held, trapped by armed agents in a cannon factory. The armed agents of the Department of Agriculture, we don't have agents, we don't have arms or people. I was at the farm. I was at the cannery. I was at the hearings. 17 workers. In the video camcorder. A lot of those some team team weeping teenage gals wearing the blue smocks, the white hair nets, eating jams with eating jam with their little fingers. Or that tiny little black girl that uh, oh, uh Tom kind of Cruise. Little... She's an actress now in a, a sitcom. Um, she plays the daughter. Um, it's not on the air yet. I don't think she sings. <laughs> and what was the worst? That everything was so sanitary. Couldn't expect a germ to live anywhere near all that lovely purity and innocence. After that mess, the hearings resumed, testimony went on and on and on in the Kernwood Farms Corporation in the offices in the cannery and the transport division and the rows of grapes and the dirt and the Agents repeating themselves like it was like the Inquisition. Different agents using the same words, same phrases. Same names. Oh, Taggart comes, and then <laughs> Taggart goes, and Taggart arrives before long. Later on that day, by Taggart. Taggart is not a common name. Two Joneses. No, Jones is common. Michaels. Up with the heads. I did, I tried. You were in charge of one head. I put Miss Marigold's head on the block. <laughs> and up steps Mrs. May for the coup de gras. Boom. Phone rings. Oh yeah, she got the notice right in the middle of interrogation number one. An interrogation. Well, yeah, that's a procedure. A series of interrogations followed by a series of termination interviews. The platform interview, the notification interview, the transition interview. All the time, the worker's head is just rolling and rolling and rolling. All this apart from any appeal process, of course. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Absurd, isn't it? All this time, the worker's head is rolling. Since the first written notification, it's aroused by Federal Express, which is not the least bit federal. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we ought to be ashamed by that. But I guess we aren't. Well, I know I'm not. But anyways, that's all that ever brings it to an end. The abductee just can't endlessly endure that horrible sensation of his head rolling and rolling in a series of pointless interviews. The abductee. Once you understand we're all about, you know, all about absurdity, about pushing the limits of the absurd, well then you just got, you got to try that to yourself. But well, when I say I back it up, I didn't mean quite, you know, all the way to the last century, I just mean to the point where you walked in here and sat down with me. At your invitation? Well, if you insist, sure, you know, you're coming in, you look a bit lost, so I... So I... <laughs> 
I didn't think we were connected. I long to be. <laughs> so you're harassing me sexually. Yeah, I thought you were a baby. <laughs> thought, thought. I now appreciate you are not in that category. You are a co-worker. Your gender is invisible to me. <laughs> you, you asked why I uh, you received an answer. Did you read the letter? The one from the brother, that is. Yes. Nope. So how did you... Well, Kate, we did not take the letter seriously. I mean, homosexual maniac. I thought you didn't read it. Oh, well, I didn't. But I sure had it quoted to me long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the homosexual maniac, huh? <laughs> I flew with them. Riggs. Riggs and Northup, who I'm up against. Nope. We seal this letter business off. Closure. It can't contaminate, it can't feed, it will die. So this is basically damage control? Damage control is no longer a term with much utility. Mm -hmm. This nomenclature was too, was too apt. Mm -hmm. Compartmentalization is just so much more elaborate and so much more ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you talk about compartmentalization for 10 minutes, you feel like all day you've been breathing fumes. <laughs> Everybody sounds like munchkins. I mean, oh, technical absurdity. Mm. You see what's happening here? Sit across the table from, I guess, from someone and talk about our fate. No one in the whole department's ever talked to me like this before. I've never talked like this to anyone. And only one other person ever talked like this to me, and I'm, I'm sure I was the only one he ever. Man for Dillman. Man for Dillman? A man first and last. Manfred Dillman. Oh, he was a man coming and going. He was the one. He, he sat me down in his office on his last day. And you know what people say about him? Uh, how long have you been with the department? Um, uh, Twelve years almost. Uh, I knew of him. Oh, some people say he was the greatest bureaucrat since J. Edgar Hoover, but they were wrong. He was greater. Tell me. <laughs> well, Hoover. Hoover was a master, a campaigner. Parted his name on the side, for Christ's sake. A conniver. But Dillman. Dillman was a genius. Dillman was a poet. I'm sure he selected me entirely at random. He must have spoke to me for five minutes. He was wearing a, a brown suit and a, a yellow, yellow shirt and a blue necktie fastened with a tarnished silver longhorn steer's head. <laughs> <laughs> he invited me to push the limits of the absurd to make that my vocation. He looked at me and said, we are surrealists. And he dismissed me. Now, do you see what's happening here? Well, all right. No. I'm offering you the formula for success, Kate. In exchange for those notes, I'm acting unilaterally. I'm utterly at your mercy. Celebrating, honey. Okay. <laughs> Celebrating what? A supremely intimate moment, and it's unrepeatable. <laughs> you said you met him? Uh, who? Um, oh, oh, uh, the brother. Yeah, he, he, he sat down at a restaurant table like this, and sat down next to me, and he, he, he called me a homosexual maniac. She didn't tell Georgina Jameson? about threats. Um, and then he called me twice. The brother, that is. Yeah, the brother. He said, get off his sister's back or he blow the whistle. I thought he was crazy. He is crazy. You know, what if he did nothing? I'm spooked into denying accusations in advance, and then the accusations never come. I tossed a coin. Tails. I'll wave 
damned if you do. Damn right you're damned. We're all damned. Pause the coin. What's gonna happen to me? Oh, nothing. It's ridiculous. Just this interview, and then we'll get Miss Marigold's termination back on track. But me? What's gonna happen to me? What? Well, I was thinking. We are. We're damned. Don't tell me you don't think. Tell me. Yes, no. Are we damned? Yes. Are you upstairs? Yes. How, uh, how long, um... Oh, no. Let's see, well, 40, 45, uh, about five minutes to walk over there. you to take me upstairs and then I want you to take me take me anywhere you want and then I want you to drag me into that conference room and then I want you to do whatever you want to me whatever you want Twenty-two days, Jim. Just twenty-two days in which to seize this golden opportunity. Twenty-two days, and that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. yeah. The shithole motel. Got the uh, puke <laughs> on the couch. You gotta go. With bullet vest. Bust in with a warrant, ride you all the way to the principal's office in a fucking electric chair. Got a lighter. If you got that, fucking oh, yeah, got a shock. <laughs> <laughs> got a boot somewhere?
Jesus. Bob Cornfield. Hey, Bob, Bob, Bob. Hey, how you doing? This Mark. Cassandra. Cass, man. Listen, if you know me, please say you know me, because right now I don't know if anybody even knows me or, or where I am, man. I don't know where I am. I'm in some shithole motel somewhere, and uh, there's this bull hole in my fucking shirt, man. I woke up with a gun, and uh, here's the situation. I was asleep, and I woke up, and there's Nine ounces of, I think it's skag, man. I lined up there so any could, anybody could just idly walk by like it's a museum of fucking heroin or something. Yeah, yeah, I, I flushed it. Yeah, I, I'm flushing it now, yeah. <clears throat> Maids? Yeah, I don't know about maids. I wouldn't care about them. They're just gonna open up the door, crack ash, and cigarette, and be off. I used to date a girl who, uh, who used to date a girl with clean rooms. Remember Jeannie? Jeannie, uh, uh, Jeannie Bailey. Yeah, remember her? Pals? Oh yeah, they're fresh. What about it? <laughs> oh, I don't know. Perhaps they didn't want to disturb the weapons and drugs of the former occupant, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you still there? Listen, this is, this situation is the outcome of some shit, and I fully admit some of that shit probably involved me. <laughs> Last thing I remember, I was on a, in a casino in Tonopah. Yeah, some little place. It was on a bus. It was some little rest stop place. You could just dip in quick, get a sandwich, and uh, lose your life savings real quick. <laughs> One of their places. Anyway, I was down to my last quarter. I stuck it down in a slot and hit for five bucks. Imagine that. My last quarter. You know, sometimes life can just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I just went up to the bar, ordered myself a sandwich and a drink. Yeah, a tequila. I don't know where I am, Bob! <laughs> I feel like I've been taken away. <laughs> like, if I open up the window, it'd be nothing but outer space outside. Oh, no, I did. It's just like a 
empty veal, <laughs> swim pool, <laughs> bunch of doors and things like cocksucker, fuck you, whore, cunt, son of a bitch, things like that. It's uh, probably still Sonoma, but might as well be Zimbabwe for all I know. Long ways from Ukiah, anyway, especially if I'm hitching. So even if I had money for a sandwich or something to eat on and some bus fare, I mean, I'd have to find Route 80, right? I probably could get out through Ed Route 80 via Route 5. Well, you're my sponsor, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I will when I get there. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> I've done something. I have done something. Whenever anyone, anywhere reaches out for help, I want the hand of Alcoholics Anonymous to always be there. For that, I am responsible. Hey, hey buddy, you need to talk to me? See that there? That's a phone. Actually, you can call me. <laughs> yeah, I've got call me. Mr. Cassandra. Yeah, who am I talking to? I'm Agent Salazar, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Oh, that's a funny name. We're not going to have a conversation, buddy. Well, no, we certainly don't have to, but we've already been talking some already, now haven't we? Has it really been that horrible? On a scale of one to ten. Be low zero. You know I was being so nasty to you a couple moments ago. You know the good cop, bad cop routine? Yeah, I was being the bad cop. He was stupid. I was stupid. I was just trying it out. You're too stupid to cop. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh man, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be rude. No, no, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah, it can be a lot more pleasant than most folks. Last month, about three weeks ago, in connection with my work, I got thrown out of a car. In connection with some undercover work I was doing, you can bet that. Did I mention that the car was moving? Oh, yeah. It was going about 30 miles per hour. I could have been thrown out of that car 10 more times in a row and would have been killed every time. But I was born lucky. And I truly believe that. How about you? Yeah, I don't really know. Well, do you generally consider yourself to be lucky on a scale of 1 to 10? Pretty far below zero. Although, I did put my last quarter in a slot machine in Tonopa, and bam! It's really hot out there. Yeah, it ain't no cooler in here. Some idiot left the uh, window open all night. Gonna break 100 today. My prediction will be 101 by 3 p.m. It's thermometer weather. What does that mean? Uh, thermometer weather, it's a, it's an expression. Uh, yeah, I've never heard that expression before. Yeah, well, shit, man, I, I guess I'm doing it again. Oh, you ever get that feeling? When you're uh, sitting at a bar or something, there's a fella in the back, and he's polishing up his cue stick, man, he's laying it aside, laying it aside, you can see he's got a knife. You just know he's gonna come up behind you, put that knife right through your spine. I get that feeling. I get that feeling a lot. I think a lot of other folks do too. I think I can tell who they are just by the way they're sitting there. Or you're sitting in the desert drinking a coffee and a little leaf falls in your cup. You fish it out, throw it away, keep drinking your coffee. But what you didn't know was that was a poison leaf. Oleander. <laughs> Oleander goes all over the West, right? And even in small doses, it's enough to kill some uh, large animals. So you took a sip of Oleander coffee, blow your motor right there. <laughs> Hey, take a seat, Salazar. Don't mind if I do. I fully admit I never should have gone to Vegas. I don't <laughs> handle big towns at all like I used to. Not like a gentleman, anyway. Yeah, too many familiar faces, right? Everybody looks like a uh, some kind of someone you used to know or a distant relative or something. You know, keep walking up with people with their, your arms out. And, oh, sorry, man, got a false read of your face. <laughs> and then you're finally certain. You come up to a guy and say, hey, Jack Tilsdale, all these years. And he turns around and says, I ain't Jack Tilsdale. Quite the opposite. 
I killed Jack Tilstead. <laughs> <laughs> Step funny and trap. Hand him over. You uh, have a right to remain safe. Oh, ho, oh, baby, 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 hey, hey. I fully admit a lot of folk would probably censor themselves. I, hey, I, I would too. But right now, we might only have a couple minutes to do our fate, baby. Our fate? Maybe a couple hours. I mean, what I do know is we only have a maximum of 22 days. Or, hey, our fate. Hey, call me Cass, all right? Cass. Cass. Where'd you get that 22 days from, anyway? I don't know, man. We all got these powers. <laughs> you ever, uh, you ever see a, a woman bone naked when she's completely dressed? We got these powers. We just don't all control them, right? We, we, we they come and go. <laughs> Your name is Mark Cassandra. You go by Cass. You grew up in Texas, Odessa. Your mother is uh, serving a long-term sentence for vehicular homicide. Your father and your stepmom are recently divorced. Your sister is currently serving a, a suspension with the Department of Agriculture. Your two brothers both have outstanding warrants and are both whereabouts unknown. You yourself live predominantly in Ukiah, California, but you get around quite impressively. You report that you were recently in Las Vegas. You report that you recently played a slot machine in Tonopah. Well, we put you in Houston last Thursday night and Dallas last Friday. Houston? Dallas? You mean Texas? I mean to say, and I do say, Houston, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> Back in Texas. Back in Texas. Oh, Jesus Christ. Hey, buddy! Back in Texas as of Thursday night. Thursday? Back in Texas at the Lue Motel. Uh, the green room. Uh, all the rooms on earth. Can I tell you? Well, we would have been uh, kids when this happened. I was uh, 13. I don't know how old you would have been when they pulled off the biggest cash robbery in Texas history. Yeah. Right here, not 50 miles from Houston. We're 50 miles from Houston. Yep, <laughs> right <up> there. <laughs> uh, Highway 22. <laughs> Brinks armored truck, a driver, armed guard, and just under $20 million in cash. Yeah. Now, they pull, they turned off, turned left off that interstate on this long incline out of town. This gradual hill goes on for about 10, 15 miles. And that time of year, the cotton fields are barren. Just nothing but huge fields of plains dirt and millions of furrows going straight back and marching up and over the hill. <laughs> Makes you sad. Just dead looking oaks, flat gray grass, dust dogs, good, good. Dust dogs, ghost devils, butterflies, candy wrappers, chasing along the wind, and this little truck crawling along the edge of Texas like a bug. I think I can. I think I can. Because the higher that that truck went up that hill, the slower the truck went. Tell me, at the top of that hill, that truck ain't going no quicker than 10, 15 miles per hour. And around that point, the General Motors pickup truck swings out from behind, carrying a group of armed men from a right-wing paramilitary organization known as the Order. And they hold up a sign saying, pull over or die. Now they got some big guns, some pretty mean ordnance. M16 shoot right through a bulletproof window. So those guards, they pull over and they hand over a dozen of duffel bags containing just under $20 million. Now, it's not the money. That's not important. It's just the hugeness and strangeness of the number uh, 20 million. 20 million. It's like a theory. 20 million. No, so, things take off and they split up into three groups. One group 
goes on, they camp down at Ore Springs Road, right. at just under 10 mil. Another group goes back to their base, their home base in East Washington County with several million dollars more. And two guys carrying the guns and several hundred thousand dollars come to the Luan Motel. This motel, our motel. And what should happen? The next morning, when they wake up and they go look out that very window, what do they see? They see the same Brinks armor truck that they knocked over the day before. Oh, shit. The FBI, marshals, and the two Brinks guys were all staying at this motel. They still <laughs> in a place up to So them two bad boys, they tiptoed out of that motel, leaving the guns and the money in an olive green duffel bag underneath the bed. Nobody found it for 16 months. Stained the rug green. <laughs> Call this place the green room. Oh, they really should charge extra for it, but they don't. <laughs> we are standing right in the middle of the history of crime. Oh, yeah, that's the whole feeling I want to share with you. Thank you. <laughs> you know, that is a nice Fine uh, replica of an ID you got there. Well, thank you. Actually, it's real. Everything except for the photo. What happened to the real Agent Salazar? I'm asking the questions. Uh, didn't I just ask you one? Mm. And didn't you answer with something like, oh, that wasn't a question? <laughs> and aren't I asking you a whole string of them, one, two, three, one after the other? What happened to him, man? Take a guess. So you're probably thrown out of a moving vehicle? I'm not here to kill you. Nah, you wouldn't do that. What kind of gun do I have? Sweet little nine. Strictly for self-defense though, right? You and the agency adhere to that policy. But I'm not with the agency. Now that you feel like you are. Not really, no. What are you after, man? What am I after? The real question is, what are we after? Who's we supposed to be? Well, I'll tell you who we aren't. We is most definitely not you and me. We is basically me and some other folk. Practically not me at all. I'm just an agent. Just not an agent of the FBI. Uh, an agent. Uh, oh, golly, I hate to call myself a tool. Ah, an instrument. Right now. An instrument of the law. Oh, you wish. Oh, uh, here we go. Law is just going to stick you in a cage and forget about you. Worst case scenario, they stick you full of poison and throw you in a hole. My people won't stop there. Yeah, I wouldn't think they would. My people will not hesitate to wipe out your entire family in a fireball. Your entire town, if possible. I know the type. We'll burn down the hospital you was born in. Slow roast the guy that gave birth to you. I said I know the type, all right? And that's just for spitting on a radio. You know, day. what do you people want? We'd like to review the last couple of days with you, Cass. Review away. Let's uh, go over your activities for, say, the last 72 hours. Can't help you much there. Maybe you need a 9mm attitude adjustment, pal. You can adjust all you want. I've been drawing, drawing a blank since Tanova, and you're saying it's Houston now. According to our information, it's Houston since last Thursday, and Dallas since Friday night. And today is... Tuesday! Jesus, Tinopel is a Wednesday. I've been on a pretty mean run, Salazar. The first tequila went down at noon. <laughs> I haven't remembered much since. Are you actually claiming amnesia? Well, yeah. Yeah, I guess I, guess I have to. Me. You ever heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Yeah, yeah, I'm most people. I mean, not really my full attention or nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, you're just typical, don't feel bad. Yeah, I did. Who said I did? The <laughs> Dead Sea Scrolls are an important revelation mm -hmm. in the history of mankind. They're found by three brothers in a cave in Egypt. Dozens of papyrus rolls. You know what papyrus is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to. <laughs> <laughs> Paper. Paper, basically. Yeah. Of an antique. I, I know what cunnilingus is. It's basically.
the cunt licking. Then as he go ahead and speak American. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'll do. So these three brothers went into this cave in Egypt with the heart of a man that they just killed. This man had just murdered a member of their family, so they killed this man in revenge. And now they were retiring into this darkened cave to take their revenge by eating his heart. <laughs> That's how they do things in Egypt. <laughs> and there they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. And well, the rest is history. What? They eat the man's heart? That is not important. <laughs> you don't know the first thing about telling the story there. <laughs> yeah. They ate his heart. It was still warm, and it went down like candy. Blood dripping off their beards, and they laughed and they laughed and they laughed <laughs> because they hated him so much. But killing him wasn't enough, and they died wishing that they could kill him again and again and again. And then they found the Dead Sea Scroll. <laughs> Which have taught us so much. So much. All right. Let me get this straight. So you people, your people. You want to know who? I think I already know. What, you see the band? It, just tell me who, please. My people. <laughs> the people who can get to you anywhere, any place, any time, here, now. They can call you on that phone. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, all right, we're waiting. <laughs> Come on. I think they're gabbing in the ear of the president or something. <laughs> Come on. Oh, Jesus Christ! <laughs> <laughs> think I don't know who you are. Standing out here in the middle of the state, not a breath of wind. You're hunting me. You're moving. You're moving. Your lust is like a knife. It's just cutting through. Cutting through. It's going to cut through everything until it finds my heart. I've been waiting. Government people gone wrong or something. What are you? DEA? FDA? DEA? DEA? No! The C of J. <laughs> C of J? What the hell? C of J? I thought you saw the van with the logo. I, I didn't see no van, alright? If I did, I would have taken notes. C, C of J. What the hell? Yeah. The children of Jehovah. Chill, chill, Jehovah. <laughs> Je Jehovah, like Jehovah's Witness? Oh, Y'all are Jehovah's oh, Witnesses. Oh, 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 oh. Absolutely! No! 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 <laughs> Let me tell you something about those folks. Sit down! Jehovah's Witnesses. JWs are false prophets, friend. Just consider this verse. How shall we know if the Lord hath not spoken? If a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, and the thing happen not, nor come to pass, then thou shalt know that the prophet hath spoken his name presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21 and 22. <laughs> Sounds like a nightmare hand of blackjack. Somebody here on 21. <laughs> <laughs> J.W.'s predicted the end of the world in 1914. The end of the world. The second coming of Christ, 1914. Well, 1914 came and went. Where was Jesus? I don't know. Exactly. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21, 22. Thou shalt not be afraid of the J.W.'s. Oh, man, you got them folk coming and going, don't you? <laughs> you know, left and right, that's and right. And back and forth. That's right. You might as well be one. Only I was. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was. A lot of us were, yeah. Formerly. But you bailed. I did. We all did. All the children of Jehovah. Because the JWs are completely polluted. Do you know that the JWs refuse to acknowledge the divinity of Christ? Can you imagine that? Do you even know what divinity is? Yeah, man. It's that scene in the manger with the animal, animals and uh, frankincense and myrrh and junk. <laughs> oh, thou generation of vipers. I know what a viper is. <laughs> it is a snake. And I'm proud to be one. Just don't go quiz me on no frankincense and murder. <laughs> that is the nativity, the birth of Jesus. Divinity means he's God. He's divine. Jesus walked on water. Jesus quelled the stormy seas. Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus spat in a blind man's eye, and that man did see and shout. Jesus pushed the stone off his own grave, descended into hell, and freed the captive spirits. But still, the JWs refused to acknowledge his divinity. Ah, uh, but you guys do. Well, actually, no, we do not, but for completely different reasons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> They get theirs from the book of Revelation. We get ours from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Okay. All right, let me get this straight. So a gang of Jehovah's Witnesses got... A the large gang. A group. A very large group. <laughs> All right, man. A group. A large group. You, you got together to form your own branch. We are not a branch. If they have a tree, we have a tree with our own roots. <laughs> <laughs> People call me a speed mouth little jazz boat. God. We have absolutely no affiliation, and our group is self sustaining, is all I. It comes from God. Okay. All right, so here's what I want to know. A gang of y'all Jehovah's group, sorry, a group of you Jehovah's Witnesses get together, form your own tree, and <laughs> you buy yourself a van, you paint your name on the side, and you drive it to my door. Well, Here's a question for you, man. Yep. I would like you to state your purpose here. Why I come to your door? Get made threats. Nah, those are just for instances. Oh, like wiping out my whole town. For hey, instance. you've been saying things too. We've been riffing. We've been joshing. We've been jiving. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you after? What do you people want? We want our effing drugs back, dude. That's right. Your drugs. Yes, indeed. All right, so y'all in the swords of Jesus, etc. cetera <laughs> thing, y'all are cocaine-pushing religious cult? To continue speaking with you would require you to have some sort of idea of the complexities of the human heart. But you, <laughs> you're a child. You're a pagan. Hey, I've been to church. You've never been thrust down in a pit on your knees so deep you can't even see how far down you've fallen. Uh, you should have had a peek at me not an hour ago when I woke up. <laughs> this is not a joke. No. No, it ain't a joke. Hey, you want to talk about waking up on the wrong side of bed? I woke up on the wrong side of the fucking universe! You just want to wake up today like, and have everything be okay. Like everybody else does. Come on, man. All right. So what's your crime? Did you lie? Did you steal? Did you lie just one big rip off? Did you kill? Kill somebody? Not so many words. <laughs> Not so many. How many words is kill? Kill. One word. <laughs> Who did you kill, Cassandra? Hey, don't call me Cassandra on its own. That's why I never joined the army. I knew people be calling me San Cassandra every fucking minute of the day. Plus, I can't take the boss and can't take orders much. <laughs> but, uh...
I lost a woman on the Colorado River a little while back. Three years exactly. Think of it. Well, yeah. That's too bad. You know, one of these days, somebody's going to come walking through that door. And it ain't going to look like the devil, but it'll be him. <clears throat> right, okay. She fell. Climbing up on the rocks when she wasn't supposed to. You know, she's one of them uh, cranky little so and so's. I mean, I ain't gonna call her a bitch. She's dead, but it's kind of what she was. <laughs> and you know, one of these pretty little people like make up the problem. Like, oh, uh, time to eat, everyone. I'm not hungry. <laughs> oh, time for coffee. I want tea. Everybody's <laughs> dog tired and time to go to bed. Oh, I, I want to have a little chat. <laughs> All right, everybody. Everybody in the raft. Everybody's on the raft. Yeah, you know, one of them folks who, you know, cuts a nice image. I mean, stylish type. Every minute of the day, stylish. You know, you know the type. You probably never talked to any of them. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean. White spiked heels, white shorts, white halter. It makes a nice little zigzaggy reflection across the hood of a red Eldorado. <laughs> Life looks better when it's reflected across the hood of an El Dorado. <laughs> and? And? And we don't all drive red El Doradas. Yeah. The woman. Right. Everybody's on the raft. Yep. Everybody in the raft. So, you know, here we are. And where is she? We're ready to get in. And where is she? She's up on a she's up on a personal hike, but and someone's got to go fetch her. I mean, this was not a hiking trip, man. This was like we were utilizing the waterways, that sort of thing. <laughs> so anyway, I go up about half a mile up the trail, and here she is. And get this, buddy. Here she is. Got her ass in the air, pants around her ankles, peeing. And here it is dribbling down on the rocks, making a clatter about 80 feet below. And she gets shipped in her foot and goes over backwards. Oh. Doesn't even make a sound. Oh. Not even the slightest yip. Not till she hits the ground. It's just a ah! Just the air. Just the air going out through her voice. I mean, later on we just had to have her choppered out and I told people we wrecked. And, you know, it wasn't a big deal. And so I told people, I told my sister that. And, uh, you know, we just got up, dried off, it was nothing. Well, these things happen in a fallen world. My sister's all right. A lot of twisted folks in this world. A lot of fakes and snakes, one-eyed jacks. I mean, most of us, right? Let's face it. Not her. Not my sister. Her name's Marigold. I'm sure Marigold is fine. You know, here's one for you, Jack. I think that woman that one time, I think she saw me watching her. I think the shock of that made her fall. Her souls are continually sought by the devil. That ain't Jesus. Now, we could help you. Join us. Oh, bite me, man. <laughs> I'm waiting for my fate. What are you doing? I'm praying for that phone ring right there. Hey. Hey, you got a remote? Come on, son, that phone ain't gonna ring. Yeah, right. Turn this up. Turn it up! An underground shopping mall in Indiantown, New Jersey will convene a panel to sift through the results of the massive investigation. Survivors of the terrible blaze God told jokes and things that were just flat out nasty. Can you create a forest full of trees a hundred years old and then just fill that forest full of snow? Can you make an elephant? Can you manufacture a whale? Who do you think warmed up this whole shebang? Can you at least admit that there is something going on here. 
bigger than you. Something majestic. Hast thou walked in search of the death? Hast thou entered the springs of the sea? Huge fireballs propelled through stores by eerie winds created by abrupt temperature changes in the four-level, mile-and-a-half square area beneath this sleepy suburb. Witnesses to the Holocaust. I do believe in God. What's the problem? I think he's me. I think he's an <laughs> asshole. <laughs> Crushing themselves through plate glass windows and shoppers carried by escalators into the flames. 87 dead have been recovered, and one stretch of hallway remains carried by escalators into the flames. Yeah. <coughs> you know, I woke up this morning with somebody's pistol. In bed? Huh. Lucky didn't shoot your own weenie off. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I've been on a pretty Pretty good bender there, Salazar. Yeah, my memory's coming back in drips and drabs. I can't help you there. <laughs> oh, you have helped me, man. You jolted my mind a little bit. I mean, you kind of got a creepy way about you, Salazar. Kind of quietly scary, if you know what I mean. It's called. Right. I come in peace, but I do mean business. Hey, 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 hey. I think uh, three, three people set this up. A woman, uh, Kate Wendell. Yeah. yeah, and her boyfriend, Jack. And I, someone, like, uh, it looks like, just like, maybe could be his brother? Whose brother? It's Jack's brother. No, he just looks like Jack's brother. That's, that's Bill Jenks. Oh, you know the guy? Brother Jenks? Yeah, he could say that, um, well, uh, he started, started the children of Jehovah. <laughs> started that he a dealer in quantity drugs he's a fallible corruptible human yeah well you sure proved that <laughs> we are every man frail consider none so frail as thyself is that one of those dead sea scroll things <laughs> thomas at campus imitation of christ <laughs> well your buddy better work on his uh, imitation there hey look at you you're here impersonating a cop, yeah. and I'm impersonating a thief, because I ain't a thief. This whole ma robbery thing just kind of materialized out of nowhere like a dream. I mean, I figure I'm in Houston, putting fear into this woman, Kate Wendell. I mean, she's right there in the phone book. Kate Wendell's my sister's boss. Yeah. yeah, this whole thing has to do with my sister's work. You know my sister? She's my one only sister, right? <laughs> you got family? They're dead to me. Mm. They're dead? Like all at once they died? Like, <laughs> they are dead to me. To me, they are dead. I, to you. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm here in Houston and uh, I knock on her door. Hey, Miss Swindle? Miss Swindle? Oh yeah, Miss Wendell, my name's Mark Cassandra, you homosexual maniac. I am Marigold Cassandra's brother. We spoke on the phone. And she says, yeah, and in Luby's cafeteria. I said, you bitch, you lie. When I eat, I sit down and order. And she's like, Jack, look who's here. And then this Jack guy comes out of the woodwork, finishes a bourbon or something, leans his head back, and comes up and deals with it. What's the folks do with me? They kind of just finish their drink quick and come to you. <laughs> anyway, and then there's this other guy. Looks like Jack. Looks like it could be related. Looks like it could be his brother. He's got a satchel. He's got a 38. What's he do? He lays that satchel down, comes up, points that 38 at me. Here's what he does, man. He shoots the gun. No, he didn't mean to. That was Brother Jake's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't say he meant to. I figured he did. It's just one of them events. <laughs> like, uh, his nerves just grabbed and boom. Just happened. But it happened. And uh, we just kind of stood there stunned for a bit. And uh, I get this feeling. I'm grabbing that satchel. I'm grabbing that gun. And I'll see you down the road later, I hope, but not really. <laughs> I mean, I was on a bender. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing's coming back to me just as I'm talking to you. 
Now I got a question for you, man. I do want to dialogue religion all of a sudden. What? Could you look upon me, perhaps, as an instrument of God? What? Well, say things happen, like things that you didn't want to happen, but you know they had to happen, and you benefited. I mean, okay, example. If there was a dog that was sick, you were gonna put him down. But then, luckily, he gets hit by a car instead. I mean, otherwise, you would have had to drag him out in the woods, shoot him yourself. Wouldn't that have crushed you? Wouldn't that have just broke your heart? And here I am, innocently driving along, and hit your dog for it. <laughs> and you're happy, because he's finally dead. <laughs> How you feel about the woman who fell? Hey, hey. The uh, lovely uh, Red Eldorado. Listen, you? man, fuck you. Flush your drugs down the toilet. It's oozing through the ecology as we speak. <laughs> the cotton's jumping. And the fish are high. <laughs> Next bad. Bad? You know what's bad is this guy is supposed to be a spiritual leader. He's got his own group. He's got his own band. And he's holding a satchel full of drugs trying to blow my ass up with a 38. That's bad. I mean, it's friend's house. And he shouldn't have friends like that anyhow. What kind of substance was it? I don't have that kind of information. I think it was cocaine. Well, that makes sense. <laughs> I don't know how this happened. Like, her boyfriend, they set the whole thing up. Her, bo her boyfriend knew uh, some uh, dirty narc, some lost soul in the DEA. Jack set this up. Yeah. And Jack ain't Brother James' brother. I believe he's brother to the devil. Ah, so you see, I am an instrument, an instrument of Jehovah. We, the children of Jehovah, we, we are just beginners. I don't know what came over me. That Kate Wendy. Can I tell you something? Of course, look upon me as an instrument. He <laughs> came to me crying last night. He wept. In my lap, wept in my lap like a child. I just think he's always been in love with her. No, she ain't that lovable. You asked for an explanation. Hey, I didn't hear myself ask. I asked for an explanation, all right? I prayed for an explanation because Kate Wendell and Jack Tungsten are evil. And he is stuck loving that woman. Stuck. His heart is broke, torn. No, I, he'll get over that one. Sure, man. She is a dog, see it, Jay. <laughs> the church is broke. We're finished. But the Lord. He. Hey, uh. Did you push an FBI guy out of your car when I was moving? Salazar. Got his jacket swapped at the movies. There's so much putrescence. There's so much vile rot, can't you? Hey, I'm an instrument! Mate. I told you that it was fate. I told you, man. <laughs> Sounds like you're just trying to sell me a book. <laughs> well, 
you, you, do you tell me your name, like we're gonna be best friends, and really just trying to sell me the famous <laughs> Aviator series? <laughs> well, what if I did that to you, man? Just when you need a friend the most. Well, cause right now, just just a second, I, I thought you were God, man. Just when you. Had.